Praise be to Scrap Monster. It's time for another scrap project, and this time it's also literary adjacent. Hello and welcome to Book Hoarding by Bianca. I'm Bianca and today I am going to walk you through my fun little tea cozy project. This is 100% a scrap project and it is also kind of a fun romp into my literary background but also a family um, kind of heirloom chest of quilt patterns. When cottagecore became a thing, like an aesthetic thing, all I could think was, um, hello, this is just Brambly Hedgecore, aka like these cute little mice that go and do adorable little ventures wearing slightly like Edwardian-ish cottagey clothes together and are adorable and eat tea and drink stuff and have lots of doilies and lace, aka my childhood dream life. So these are beloved stories from my childhood and of course when I was thinking of scrap projects for winter I immediately was like let me consult this book because I know there's tons of little cute cozy things that are in here from little aprons to cute bonnets to all these adorable things that I think would be nice and cozy winter sewing even though technically we're still on fall but like who, who cares it's cold. So I came upon this adorable little scene where um, they're having tea and there's this little patchwork tea cozy. And I had a ton of scraps left over from a bunch of different projects that I've been doing over the year. And I thought, you know what, this is a perfect time to get out my scraps and to make a little quilted piece like the, we see in the book. I also decided to use a family heirloom um, thing of quilted patterns. I have a old box that's been handed down for a while. My great grandma kind of maintained it um, and it had patterns, embroidery patterns and quilt patterns that were from her time and from the folks around her that were older and she's kept she kept that for a long time and I eventually got it after she passed so I have these vintage quilt patterns and embroidery patterns that I've been slowly going through my patrons will remember I actually did a whole unboxing video that goes into detail about all of them and shows off all the vintage embroidery and quilting patterns so if you are a patron don't forget to check that out it is still linked in the feed and if you're not a patron you know check out my patreon because you can literally watch me just rambling and showing you vintage patterns while I wax lyrical about my life. Anyway, so I decided to basically use the kind of closest to what I was saying in the drawing, at least in my interpretation, of the little um, pattern they had, because it seemed a little elongated. So I found a pattern piece I thought would work, and it was a slightly larger pattern piece, um, which I thought was good just to kind of get through the big scraps that I have. And you can see here, I think it turned out pretty cute. Uh, I will walk you through how I made it, but I made little holes so that much like in the Brambly Hedge thing, you don't have to take it off to use it and to pour it. Oop. I will be putting up the pattern for this tea cozy, just like the outside pattern and the quilt pattern piece on my Patreon. So if you're a patron, check that out. It should be up by now, but it's a fun little thing that you'll have access to as a thank you for being here. I know it's a very simple thing and I'll actually walk you through how I made this pattern, but it's a nice little nod as a thank you because you get my family's little heirloom pattern pieces, but digitized. Here are the things you're gonna need for this. I use patterning paper to make this i use measuring things to custom measure it to my teapot so you're probably gonna want those things too i used again scrap pieces so find yourself a quilting pattern if that's a thing that you want to do or you can make one for this i used scrap for a really basic third middle layer that would kind of add a little bit of volume and another layer of just kind of keeping things nice and cozy and warm if you have quilting batting or something else like a wool or flannel or like a poly fleece or something that you want to use for that, go for it. You can totally choose to make this more durable, um, more washable, or maybe just more like cute and you want to use like lace and stuff. Maybe you don't want to wash it a ton. Have fun with it. It's a scrap project. It's meant to be kind of a stash buster. Get rid of some of the fabric you've got lying around. That's not for a project. I will also reluctantly, I will also very reluctantly admit that I actually use my iron a ton for this project and it was very helpful. I actually include a clip later that you'll see where it's the unironed piece versus it ironed and how easier it was to actually work with it. So I have finally been defeated by the iron gods and will admit that it is useful for sewing. So let's get to the project. So patrons will remember I actually posted a full unboxing 
of this family heirloom, which is just full of vintage patterns, uh, vintage embroidery patterns, and vintage quilt patterns that have been kept and passed down from one side of my family. I go over these in much, much more detail on a Patreon-only exclusive video, so if you want to check that out, you can. Um, otherwise, just you can get a sneak peek here of me going through some of these really interesting patterns to find the quilt pieces that I am slowly going through and making sturdier copies of and eventually digitizing. So I wanted to try to use the biggest scraps that I had. So I went for some of the bigger patterns that kind of reflected the shape that I was seeing in the illustration. Um, some of these go to like quilts, like there are ads in here that definitely show these going to the same quilt. But otherwise I'm just looking for pieces that I think will work for this specific Brambly Hedge piece that I'm working on. You can see the little book on the right hand, lower right hand side, the edge of the book. So I'm just looking at that as a cross reference. But anyway, it's a really special box. Um, I don't know if any of you have relatives, patterns, or sewing stuff. I know that like the meme is that it's always in a cookie tin, and I definitely grew up with that blue cookie tin being uh, full of sewing supplies, but for me this box was also full of patterns that were special. So first I'm going to trace onto extra little scraps of my pattern paper that I use for my patterning class. These pieces. And just getting them, getting the shape on there, trusting it, trusting the process. And then in a second, you'll see that I will actually get the ruler out to straighten the edges up, make them good. And I did a few pieces because I wasn't sure which ones I wanted to use for this. So I gave myself some options here, and I might use the smaller pieces for other projects, but that's pretty small. I'm using my clear quilters ruler here. Clear rulers are really, really useful for a lot of projects. The only problem is if you're working on darker fabric, sometimes it's definitely going to be harder to see the numbers. But otherwise, it is super useful to use. Don't use a felt tip pen with it though, because the ink will just come off on the edge and then bleed on everything the ruler touches. Ask me how I know this. Ask me how I know this. So after I refine the patterns just to make sure they're even, you can see the fold marks I did in the lower left hand one to just true the edges and everything. I then transferred the perfected trued patterns onto scrap paper that I use for my final patterns, like slopers. And it's essentially a roll of manila paper. Yes, I have a link to all this stuff in my description if you are looking for pattern making supplies. I also have a pattern making video. You can check out if you want to, but it's just a really basic pattern drafting info dump. So it doesn't go into a ton of details, but I'm basically just using this manila paper to make this sturdy. If you have a manila folder, it works just as well. Yes, those are my paper scissors, don't you worry. I was using my scrap pieces of this manila paper. You can see on the right upper right hand corner, you can see that it comes in a roll. I was using scrap pieces because I've been making slopers to make final patterns for my final, like my final, not like the final pattern as in like the working pattern, then it's the final pattern with all the marks and stuff, um, like the production thing. I'm talking about final as in like the final for my fashion class. If that makes any sense. I don't know if it makes sense. I know what I'm talking about. Anyway, so I'm cutting these out after tracing them. Again, I just, you know, cut out the things I thought might be fun to work with. 
maybe for favorite projects. I'm definitely eyeing some quilting stuff for some other kind of cozy craft things. And because I came on a roll, it was a little bit um, apt to kind of roll up. So I just, at the end there, folded that up a little bit. Okay, so now I'm going over my scrap pieces and trying to get an idea of like where these are gonna fit, what's gonna work. I am using my rotary cutter to cut these out. Again, my table is covered with cutting mats that are self-healing for rotary cutters to be used on. So don't do this unless you have that set up because you will just cut your table and blunt your blade. And a, a dull blade is just really not fun. To work with so it's probably safer anyway could i have pinned these down probably but i didn't so eventually i start to get smart and just start tracing these because it's just easier with some of these bigger pieces that are lighter but you can do what you want i knew that there would be seam allowance in these so once i started marking them i didn't exactly use a heat erase pen or a water soluble pen i decided to use pen pen because i'm the only person that will see it and i don't have a problem with that if you have a problem with that you should probably use chalk or a heat erase pen that's all I'm going to say there. Now, for the, the scrap pieces, I wasn't really concerned about grain. Um, I don't really quilt. There might be quilters who are watching this who are like, Oh my god, you should have done certain grain lines. I don't know. Um, I only really care about grain lines for patterning clothing. Because that helps dictate drape and such and fit. I wasn't really concerned with that here. And I was going to roughly sew down all the pieces later, so I wasn't too concerned about stretch and such. Um, quilters, if you have advice on bias or no bias in your pattern piece, grain or no grain, let me know. I'm curious. Um, I definitely remember my great-grandma basically being like, just cut the piece that fits. Um, I think the quilting tradition I come from is... 100% based on scraps and it's right and I'd say it's early but it's actually the same day because you can tell I'm wearing the same baby Yoda PJs this is just the light is finally in this room at this time of the day that's how light works so now I'm measuring the widest parts of my tea kettle I'm, I'm doing half and then I'll double it and add um, half an inch to each piece. That's how that works, right? So then that will be the complete roundness of this. But I really just need half if I'm making one pattern piece, if that makes sense. So I'm measuring the like widest part and giving a little bit of extra space because this also is going to be tea cozy. You probably use on other tea kettles. This is my tallest one. So... I'm definitely using this as the example for the tallest potential that I could do and the widest potentially. I don't know. So it's, I, I'm using this to kind of figure out, and you can see my fingers mining there where the cozy will go. So now I'm getting out my Ikea paper. You can get craft paper at Ikea in large rolls and it's actually perfect for starting out on pattern making because it's a ton of paper and um, it's pretty easy to fold and it goes a long way. It lasts a while. So anyway, I'm folding it here to just make a little edge that I can work with. I'm making sure that it will be wide enough even at half width to help with my thing. I actually think at this point I was going to try to do the whole piece on one side and then I midway through you can see me measuring and thinking out and being like actually I should just make it half things just work that way 
Like, I don't always go into making a pattern or making things being sure of the right or best way to do something. And that's okay. I think there are many ways to go about solving a problem or being creative. And sometimes you just have to go with what you think works best. And that's okay. If it doesn't work well, then you can go back and redo it. And that's kind of the beauty of working with scraps and using your scraps to try new things. Because if you mess up, then it's not as big of a deal. That's why usually like for starting out on pattern making for clothes, like you're using muslin or you're working half scale. So it's less scary because it's um, not as much material and you can save a little bit in budget. So I have a really nice pattern paper that you saw earlier, the alpha numerical, but I'm not using that here. I'm using the Ikea paper because it's not really for a garment and I don't need that much exactness. So I've squared this off and I've added a quarter inch seam allowance. Um, Cause I think that's about what I'll need. I think I added about uh, an inch to the original circumference. Is that the right word? Whatever. Just because I knew that the quilted pieces, there's gonna be some plus minus in there and they might, there might be shrinkage, I don't know. And I might need to make the edges a half inch seam, but I wasn't stressing. I used a fringe curve to curve off that edge because I knew that it could from my teapot. And then I'm trying to make sure that's lined up before I cut through it with, yes, my paper scissors. I have paper scissors and I have not paper scissors. And they look very different. My paper scissors have black handles. None of my fabric scissors have black handles. So pro tip, make them look different. It helps. And then there we go. We are done with that part. Before we move on to actually making this thing, I actually held this up around the teapot to kind of gauge spacing and stuff. So if you do a similar drafting technique, you should definitely test with your paper to make sure it fits. Even if you just have half the piece of paper and you don't do the full piece like I did, even if you have like a paper bag or something that you use um, or wrapping paper. So now I'm starting to sew the quilted pieces. Now I again, I am not a quilter. So if I did any of this wrong, I don't really care. If you know of a better way to do this, then I would welcome your contribution to the conversation. But otherwise, this was just a scrap project, and I thought that sewing the straight parts first, the straight edges, would be the easiest. It was not, but that was the mistake that I made. I like to include my mistakes so that you know that no one is perfect, especially not me. So now you can see the pattern piece I used. I have it laid out. I found it helpful to do this full size um, even though it is a pattern that you would fold and cut on the fold for theoretically. Yeah, there's a center seam or center like line where it mirrors. I just found this really helpful to lay out my strips of pieces. It's personal preference. So you can see here that I didn't iron these pieces and this doesn't really lay flat. So as much as I hate ironing, this is the ironed piece and it's so much easier to work with. You can just see it. So take it from me, a person who really, really hates ironing. It's helpful to iron. I said it. I hated it that I had to say it. I hate that I just said it. I, blah, blah. Sometimes it helps. Anyway, so I'm pinning down the original pattern to this and just cutting around it because I included the seam allowance in that original pattern 
and it is doubled and it's just going to be a great template for making this because I'm going to make multiple layers and they're all going to sandwich together as lining and not lining and all the good things. I could have definitely thought about modifying the pattern pieces so they'd fit a little bit nicer uh, or whatever, but I didn't. I just wanted to use this pattern. At the end there you saw that I used scraps to make the lining so it looks a little like a blue ombre stripe but it was just scraps that I happened to have that were strips that would line up easily and work for the inside and the inside doesn't need to be nice it just needs to work and this is the improvised middle layer if you will which is just pieces of muslin or other fabrics that I've used so you can see them here with right sides together I have the lining facing the quilted piece and then under the quilted piece is this improvised inter lining thing which is it's not super sturdy I use just muslins I just wanted to give one more layer for I guess keeping the heat in whatever that's called my brain doesn't work anyway then I just sewed around with those layers pinned in place and the edges trued up and I just turned on the corner and then I trimmed the corners when I was done turned them out but make sure that you leave I'd say maybe three, two or three inches unsewn because that's how you're going to pull it inside out if you've never done this. So pretty much you're just going to be turning this whole thing inside out and the, like this is the next to final sewing step for this. I mean I guess there's two more sewing steps so I, I don't know. I made things harder myself. So you just cut the corners so that they'll lay easier. I believe I also clip the curve a little bit to make it curve a little nicer. We'll see in a second, but it's definitely little, little touches like that that I think help take your sewing from okay to like getting there, like getting grade A. Like you can see the quality difference. The reason I showed you the ironed versus unironed was because I really wanted to show that like these little things do make a difference when it comes to the final product or even the steps along the way. You, you see me using this little dowel and I'm just poking out the corners to make them as sharp as can be. And when I cut the corners inside, that helped to reduce the bulk so that those corners could pop out and be all nice. That's the secret to those corners. And then I'm just kind of finger, um, not pressing. I like finger pulling the pieces uh, along the outer seam so they're a little even. Then I just kind of finger pressed the open two to three inches that I talked about before and I pressed them in place and just sewed down a little top stitch over them so that it would stay in place because you saw it was gapping without the stitch. So you just do that. If you want to top stitch the entire out outer layer you can it's really up to you. So then I ironed it. Ooh, it looks so nice ironed, doesn't it? Yeah, I, I, I'm a recent convert to ironing when it's necessary. I was a no iron person. But I see, I see that there is some use for it. So I just kind of freehanded um, sewing over the lines on this, AKA like stitch in the ditch, if you will. I just wanted to kind of make it sturdier, so I just kind of sewed zigzags along like the pattern pieces, edges. It's nothing really scientific, you don't have to do this, I just kind of wanted to give it a little extra structure and keep those pieces in place. So quilters, again, if you have better methods for these, let me know. You can see on the inside there, some of them just like hodgepodge I did. And I'm showing you with my fingers where I'm going to sew. I'm going to be leaving open space on the edges for the handle and the spout. Here's my handle, here's my spout. Anyway, I left open pieces so that you could get those out or so that you could have everything be covered nicely. 
you can see I'm measuring a yes use a measuring tool to just double check things double check my seam allowances double check little things like that because I think it's really important uh, to try to get more precise as I go I used to really not use rulers I used to eye a lot of things and with my fashion classes I'm taking this semester I am really really trying to do better and you can see my thread check-in right there I won and the big not really reveal that yes it does fit and yes you can still access the handle and the spout easily or you can cover them back up to keep things nice and toasty and there we go you have a take hosey What is this I see? I don't know about these rodents, but I do appreciate these scraps. Look at my fine friends, finally used in a project. <gasps> Blue and red, I remember when she was gonna make a scrap project that was bell themed. That never happened, did it? I am so pleased to see my scrap family finally be used. Now, we need to get her to make a full scrap quilt. And then my powers will be unbeatable. Thank you for joining me and watching that fun project. I hope it was an exciting, cute little adventure. And I hope that you will try it yourself. If you have your own kind of wintery scrap projects that you're working on, let me know. Since this is a bookish channel, not only was I reading Brambley Hedge, but while I was making this, I was listening to Garth Nix's Tercial and Eleanor, which is the kind of prequel to Sabriel, but mostly just a wonderful romp into her parents' first meeting and kind of subsequent adventures right after that. I thought it was a really heartfelt book. It really added to her story because when we meet Sabriel's mother at the beginning of Sabriel, she has she doesn't say anything she just dies while giving birth and that's all we really get of her and we also don't get a ton of her father either as he's kind of off somewhere else during the events of it without giving too much away so in Tercio and Eleanor instead we get to actually center those characters and get to watch you know Tercio is just now becoming the apportion awaiting he's having to deal with Maga being nefarious and getting to know the apportion's house and all the ins and outs of dealing with death we meet Eleanor who it's kind of in a really interesting situation that sends her to early college and my heart was really really warm because there's so many good things where she's like doing stage choreo like stage combat and then she like gets into like actually recruited into like doing sword combat with the sword class which makes me very happy and very biased i thought that was specifically written for my heart and then there's like a secret magic club after school that happens which isn't a spoiler it's just like a cool component and i think it's like an extra selling point for her story alone. I think ultimately I found her story in that book more compelling just because she is written as such like a warm, loving, amazing character and by the time you get to the end of it, by the time you get to the end of it, it's really like I felt really betrayed. Like now I've grown like to be in love with this character. I know her ending. I know what happens but I feel like Garth Nix really really intricately wove the ending so that it's heartbreaking but okay. Like it's very like if you're a reader of the series and you know what happens, then you're kind of content with how he rates it, if that makes sense. If you would like to see previews of this content, including getting patterns and stuff, check out my Patreon. Various tiers get various levels of goodies every month, and it's just a nice way to support this channel. Patrons at the Lizzie Bennett here and above get a special shout out in all my videos. But again, thank you to all my patrons because without you, none of this could happen. Y'all are people who support me month to month and like, give me a little extra income to up the production costs slightly every time I make one of these. Thank you for joining me and don't forget to make it so and don't forget to stay cozy because it's cold out and we need to keep our tea warm. You don't need to film me eating a scone. No one needs to watch me eat. Ha. Ah. Mm.